Our sermon text this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. Then the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Then the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now you have conceived and shall bear a son. And you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, I pray now that you would pour your Holy Spirit through me, that these words might truly become your living word to your people. And I pray that you would open up each of our hearts and minds that we might receive that word exactly in the place that we need to hear it. For we pray this in the name of our risen and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We are continuing this morning in our sermon series, Family Matters as we take a look at some of our earliest spiritual ancestors in the book of Genesis. This morning, we take a look at Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, as they were still known at this point. Now, Abram and Sarai were from the ancient city of Ur, which is in modern-day Iraq. But along with Abram's father and his nephew, they had all packed up and moved their family to a place called Haran, which is in modern-day Turkey, and there they thrived and prospered. But then one day, when Abram was 75 years old, the Lord appeared to him and told Abram to pack up all of his things, leave behind everything he knew, and go to a place that God would show him. For God said, I will make a great nation of you, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I've often tried to imagine the conversation that took place between Sarai and Abram after this incredible encounter with God. We're doing what? We're going to pack up everything and uh, move again. And we're going where? Um, he didn't exactly specify, and who told you this? The Almighty? And he's going to make what of you? A great nation? Right. You forget, Abram, that I am a barren woman. Barrenness was particularly difficult for women in those days. For it was generally considered a woman's purpose in life to give children to her husband, especially sons. And when one could not, she was usually viewed with great suspicion by everyone around her who wondered what terrible thing must she have done for God to have cursed her womb with barrenness. So I'm sure that hearing this absurd promise from God was 
really a knife in Sarai's heart as it poked at that open wound she had been carrying around with her her entire married life. And it tempted her with a, a hope she just couldn't afford to risk. After all, her childbearing years had long since passed. You know what the pain and barrenness is like, don't you? I mean, certainly some of you have, have desperately waited for a child to come along and, and it hasn't happened. But barrenness comes in many forms. Maybe, maybe for you it's your inability to create the life that you want or, or to find the love of your life. Maybe it's your inability to fix your loved one or to uh, find a sense of purpose for your life. It could be your inability to communicate with your teenager or to reason with your aging parent. And maybe it's the job that is just so slowly sucking the life out of you day after day or the, the empty, lonely house you go home to every night. Or maybe it's just your soul that feels barren as you wonder why God seems to be at work in everyone else's life but yours. And like the psalmist, you want to cry out to God, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? Certainly, one of the hardest things for us is having to wait through a season of barrenness in our lives. Of course, we all tend to have a hard time waiting for just about anything these days, don't we? I mean, we live in such an instant society, the Amazon Prime world, where we expect to have everything we want right away. I mean, heck, how many car accidents have been caused because someone couldn't wait just a couple of minutes to read or respond to a text message? I mean, waiting is, it's almost an insult to us. It insults our intelligence and our competence. It mocks our ability to get what we want when we want it. It also reminds us that we are not in control, that we are not the center of the universe, that we are not God. And we've always had a hard time accepting that. But perhaps the hardest thing for us to wait for is when we're waiting for God to do something about our situation. Now, to Abram's credit, he'd already been waiting for quite a long time. It had now been 10 years since God had first appeared to him and promised that he would have a child with Sarah. And Abram was now 85 years old. And so far, nothing. No child, no fulfillment of God's promise, no hope for the future, not even a glimmer of light, which is all any reasonable person could expect, right? I mean, after all, not only was Sarai barren, but she was now 76 years old. Surely they were waiting in vain, as the possibility of them having children was only becoming more and more absurd. And so Abram began to have his doubts. But then, but then it occurred to him that maybe, maybe God just needed a little assistance with this one. Maybe God was waiting for Abram to take some initiative and get the ball rolling. Actually, it was Sarai who came up with the plan. And she tells Abram to take her slave girl, Hagar, and have a child with her. And then Sarai would raise that child as her own. And Abram would have the child that God had promised. Just Sleep with the help and all of our dreams will come true. <laughs> it was a terrible idea then. It's a terrible idea now. <laughs> but this is typical how we deal with the promises of God. We, we turn them into reasonable goals that just need a little help from us to complete. Now in fairness... To Sarai, her suggestion was not only unheard of, but certainly not even an unreasonable one in their culture. Of course, 
the culture around us will often suggest to us very reasonable sounding things that do not correspond to the will or the word of God. So Abram listened to the voice of Sarai, and they enacted this plan to attain the promised blessing from God. But then the plan actually worked. And I'm sure to everyone's surprise, it didn't turn out quite as gloriously as they had imagined. When Hagar knew that she was pregnant, she became puff, puffed up with pride and conceit, and she looked down on her mistress with contempt. And then all of Sarai's insecurities and humiliation at being barren rose up like a tidal wave. And it was just too much for her to take. And then the blame game began. Are you starting to detect the theme in these stories yet? The blame game began as Sarai cast responsibility for this catastrophe at Abram's feet. Even though it was her idea, remember. But the truth is, it, the responsibility for this really was Abram's in the end. I mean, after all. It was to him that God had appeared and repeatedly promised a son with Sarai. But rather than listening to the voice of God and trusting in God's word, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai instead. I mean, he never meant to cause any problems. It's just that there just seemed to be such a gap between the promises of God and the way things actually were. That he just figured he'd help God out a little bit with his plans. And so often in our lives, the promises we read in Scripture do not seem to measure up to the facts on the ground, to our actual experiences in our lives. I mean, we hear these promises and, and we want to believe them, but so often they, they sound like distant dreams. And so we too tend to have a hard time waiting around for the promised blessing to arrive. I mean, eventually we figure if, if anything's ever really going to happen, then it must be up to us to make it happen ourselves. I mean, it's not that we don't trust God exactly. It's just that, well, we have our doubts. So when God does not act with the speed that we expect or in the manner that we prefer, we tend to snatch our prayers right back and go about fixing or accomplishing things ourselves. Of course, we're just trying to help. I mean, surely God must be incredibly busy with Ukraine and, and all the gun violence and, and, and monkey pox. We're just trying to give God a little helping hand. But the truth is, all we're really trying to do is fulfill our own agendas and generate our own blessings. And as we do so, we usually end up making a lot of mistakes. Mistakes in our careers, mistakes with our money, mistakes with our friendships, mistakes in our families. And those are usually the most painful ones, aren't they? The mistakes we make with our children and in our marriages. Of course, and then we usually spend a huge amount of energy trying to make those mistakes go away, which tends to make things a whole lot worse than we started with. I mean, Abram compounded his mistake of not trusting God by letting Sarai do whatever she wanted to Hagar, the mother of his child. Sarai compounded her mistake of trying to concoct her own divine blessing by mistreating an innocent pregnant girl. Hagar compounded her mistake of poking Sarai's barren wound by running away into the wilderness. But this is typically how we deal with our sin. Rather than taking responsibility for it and offering it to God in confession, we try to cover it up with more sin, hoping it'll all just run away. But as we saw two weeks ago with Adam and Eve, and last week with Cain and Abel, our sin never runs away for long. That's because our God is not interested in making our mistakes disappear. 
Rather, God wants to redeem them and transform them into blessings, something only a Savior can do. And our God has the power to take broken things and make them new again. God can take our, our broken relationships and our broken marriages and make them stronger than they ever were before. God can take our broken dreams and create possibilities we never imagined. God can take our broken hearts and transform them into fountains of healing for others. Even our biggest mistakes can be redeemed when we place them into the hands of God just as God took Abram's disobedience and lack of faith and transformed it into the blessing of new life as Hagar became pregnant with a baby boy. But when Hagar ran away into the wilderness after Sarai had mistreated her, an angel of the Lord went and found her and told her that she needed to return to her mistress because running away is not how we deal with our mistakes in the family of God. But then the angel assured her that, that God was going to bless her child so that she would have offspring beyond counting, much like God had promised to Abram and Sarah. Then the angel told her to name her child Ishmael, which means God hears because the Lord had heard her cry. And you can be sure that God hears us as well. When we cry out over the painful consequences of sin, when we're struggling through a barren wilderness season in our lives, when we offer to God our mistakes and our bad decisions in confession, and God can transform all of it into blessings. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, God works through all things for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean that everything happens for a reason. The Bible never says that. But it does mean that no matter what happens, God is able to work through it and transform it into a blessing. But remember, God doesn't just bless us for our own sakes. Now, just as with Abram, God blesses us so that we might become a blessing to others. And, as you all know, the promised blessing from God did eventually arrive for Abram, and Sarah gives birth to a baby boy named Isaac. Of course, it did require 14 more years of waiting, but during that time, Abram learned some very important lessons. He learned that God operates according to God's own timetable, which may not always make much sense to us at the time. He learned that, that God's blessings are never something we can achieve for ourselves, but can only be received as a gift. And he learned that our God can be trusted, even in the wilderness places of our lives, because God always hears us when we cry, and in Jesus Christ was literally dying to bless us. And our barrenness is really just an invitation to draw closer and closer to the Savior from whom all blessings flow until the risen Christ returns to lead us into a new heavens and a new earth where all barrenness and all sorrow will be done away once and for all. Until then, our job is to live with hope and to listen to the Savior's voice above all else because Jesus Christ came that we all might have a life of blessing. For in him, Paul writes, every one of God's promises is a yes. 
In Jesus Christ, we too become children of Abraham, heirs to the promises of God. In Christ, we too become blessed so that we might become a blessing. And in his resurrection, we too have the assurance that despite the way things might appear in our lives, we serve a living God who has the power to redeem even our biggest mistakes and who can be trusted. And that may be the biggest blessing of all.